Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, Methods Guru for Sage Method Space. And I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Tulio Rossi um, to talk about visual communication and animations uh, as ways to communicate our research. But before we get started, if you are new to Method Space, um, this is a blog community um, hosted by Sage Publishing. And we're interested in all things to do with uh, designing, planning, analyzing research, writing about it, and sharing results in a variety of ways, hopefully to create some impact. And you can see at the heart of this Venn diagram, I have teaching and learning, because we believe that whether you are a student, a new researcher, or, or an experienced researcher, we all have something to learn. So. Um, Tulio, why don't you just begin by uh, introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about um, Animate Your Science. Of course. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, Janet. It's great to be back for the second time here on Method Space. So I'm the director of Animate Your Science. So we are an agency that helps researchers have an impact. So the, most of what we do are video animations that help researchers mm -hmm. explain their research to whichever target audience they're most interested into reaching. Most of the time, what we do is geared towards the general public. That's what we're really passionate about, is uh, making science mm -hmm. truly accessible to everyone. Right, right. So, you know, really fitting into that diagram that I just showed about sharing results and creating some impact, you know, beyond, you know, kind of our own uh, little uh, circles. Um, but, you know, to begin with, maybe you could talk a little bit about visual communication generally, you know, why is it important for researchers to think about communicating their research visually? And <clears throat> how does that need uh, change what we think of as academic writing? Of course. So let's take a step back and look at academia as a whole. So for decades, uh, following the dogma of publish or perish, mm -hmm. uh, researchers learn how to write as many papers as, po as mm -hmm. possible and publish them in the best journals as possible, which, however, had a side effect. It resulted in today's situation where we have two and a half million papers published every single year. That's about 7,000 per day. Uh, just to give you an idea, and dur during my PhD on ocean acidification, I would have had to read more than three papers per day, including weekends and even Christmas Day, uh, just to keep <laughs> up with the literature. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think I did that? Mm. No, and I'm sure the I'm, researchers. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not telling. You know, just. <laughs> Well, I didn't read all those papers, and I'm sure that many of the researchers watching uh, this uh, video are not also reading all these papers constantly. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the reality of things. We are publishing more than we can read. Mm -hmm. And it's known, that all, it's known that almost half of the peer-reviewed papers out there are not cited a single time. So this is a big waste of funding, right. money, and researchers' time. What's the point of publishing all this research if it has no impact whatsoever? Right. So um, I think where, here's where visual communication comes in. Uh, visual communication is, is a very powerful tool that can help you, researcher, stand out and mm -hmm. make sure that what you publish doesn't just get lost in an online repository, mm -hmm. but actually is noticed and has an impact. And, mm -hmm. and starts a conversation with people out there, might be on social media, on news sites or wherever, but it, it, we want that research to be noticed so that it can solve its purpose. Right, right. So with your agency, you do uh, work with graphics and with animation. So maybe you could describe some of the options that um, people have for communicating the research in a visual way. Absolutely. So the I would say the the lowest hanging fruit is the graphical abstract. Mm -hmm. So these traditionally were seen as a very simple diagram, straight to the point, mm -hmm. uh, typical you know chemistry thing of molecule A meets molecule mm -hmm. B. They they have this reaction and they do this thing together. 
however, when, when I saw these graphical abstracts, uh, when I started um, animature science, I felt like these would not work for the general public. Mm -hmm. So I came up with a new format and a format that gave enough context and enough explanation so mm -hmm. that also non-experts, but are not familiar right. with the topic, will be able to make sense of it right. uh, without reading the paper. Right. So that's the format I created. I call it the infographic style graphical abstract. I can quickly mm -hmm. show you an example of what I mean, okay. which will, I'm sure it will make more sense. Uh, once, right, we have to walk the talk and, and communicate visually. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, so here, what you're looking at right now is a graphical abstract, which mm -hmm. has 80 words. That's the limit uh, I gave myself. Okay, let's explain the whole story of a paper in 80 words. So I decided to break it down into four text boxes and mm -hmm. have about 20 words of background, 20 of uh, question or knowledge mm -hmm. gap, 20 for the key result, and another 20 for the conclusion. And all the rest is visuals. And I found this format worked much better when on social media because it made it the story accessible to everyone, right. not just right. experts. Right. Uh, and so this is a, a type of graphical abstract that can stand on, on its own legs. It doesn't need the paper right. to be read with it. Right. This is act more like a, a teaser. You know, it mm -hmm. briefly, very briefly tells you what this paper is about. And then you right. make a judgment whether you're interested and you, you want to read the whole thing or maybe not. And that's fine. But at least now you understand what the research was about. Right, you, lo you learn so, something. And uh, one thing I'd like to, to uh, highlight from your description here is that I think for, for most researchers who have been immersed you know, for a long period of time in the study, whether it's as a part of a thesis or dissertation or the research they're doing um, in their academic or professional lives and trying to communicate it in a succinct way that a person who is not an expert in their field can understand. So it would seem to me that just the process of thinking through, you know, what are those key points? You know, what will get, you know, here was the problem, here's what we looked at, here's what we found, you know, in a, in a succinct way that, you know, I think would, would be helpful to the researcher in addition to the use of the graphic, just the exercise of doing it, I would think would be, um, would be helpful. Absolutely. It, it's actually a bit tricky to condense it down to such a, a, a succinct, mm -hmm. in such a succinct way. But w w once you uh, learn how to do it, it, it's a really good exercise. And it will actually will help you gain clarity on, on what the paper uh, really right. is about. So another format that is available to researcher you know, for the more audacious ones is a comic strip. So this is not for everyone, I would say. You need to be a bit courageous. Uh, but if you are one of the courageous ones, this is very powerful because mm -hmm. it also adds the power of humor. And if you can, can trigger a laugh, people would really mm -hmm. remember you. Mm -hmm. right. So it, it can be extremely powerful. And this one you're looking at right now um, was used by this researcher. Uh, she took this uh, graphical abstract, put it on her poster, went to a conference with it. Mm -hmm. And she said the, the response was mind blowing because everyone showed up at her poster because they were curious. What is mm -hmm. this thing? It's different. It's completely different to all the other posters. And so it triggered mm -hmm. curiosity. Uh, mm -hmm. And the bottom line is that this researcher, after this poster session, had um, a new, um, ended up having a new co-authorship and even was invited to write a book uh, wow. <laughs> on, on biofilm. So all of this is the product of good networking, but good mm -hmm. networking starts with conversations and right. you need to stand out and attract attention right. because otherwise there's hundreds of other researchers at every conference. If all the posters look the same, you're not, you're not going to get noticed. Right. So this is an, an, another good reason why I'm, you know, being different and, and standing out right. is a good idea. So this is for graphical abstracts. Uh, for video instead, um, I think video, are, video abstracts are more powerful uh, mm -hmm. because you have more opportunity to really articulate the story. 
Mm -hmm. uh, just to give you a rough idea, in a two-minute video, you will have a script of about 300 words, mm -hmm. which is definitely more than what we've mm -hmm. seen mm -hmm. in this graphical abstract. So mm -hmm. it will allow you to go in a bit more depth. Uh, and you have options in terms of what it could look like. The, in the simplest form, uh, it can simply be like we're doing right now, mm. a talking head video, mm -hmm. uh, talking to your webcam or to your phone. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be just that. No, no need of um, you know, doing anything fancy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can do um, put uh, your voice on top of some PowerPoint slides mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and may maybe mix it. Maybe you do some PowerPoint slides and then you go back to yourself mm -hmm. on camera and then you go back to the slides to make it a bit more mm -hmm. interesting. But then there's a third option, uh, which I think is, of course, my favorite. I might be biased on this one, which is mm -hmm. animation. Mm -hmm. Animation is great because it works on every topic. Doesn't matter if you can film it uh, or not. You can make a mm -hmm. drawing about anything and animate that drawing. So another great thing is that you don't need to be on camera. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I used to be quite camera shy myself. And mm -hmm. when I figured out that there was this other option the, where I didn't have to be on camera, right. I definitely went right. down that path. Because right. it, the reality is most people are quite uncomfortable recording themselves in front right. of a camera. Right. Uh, so if you don't have a lot of experience with, with that, you, you might want to consider animation as an right. alternative. And animation, there's a, a very wide range. Uh, I would say you start the entry level point is the whiteboard animation. And that's where I started doing my PhD. I made a whiteboard animation mm -hmm. about my, my research paper and it worked really well. Um, whiteboard videos, uh, I love them because they force you to keep things simple. Mm -hmm. There's only one moving object, which is the, the hand drawing I see. Uh, uh -huh. and, all the and all the rest static. And so that's good in communication because you don't want to overwhelm with too mm -hmm. much cognitive load. Um, but if you want something more dynamic and um, uh, with a higher production quality, then you go into 2D motion graphics animation. And if perhaps the um, 3D structures are really important to illustrate your mm -hmm. point of your, the point of your research, maybe you work on proteins or molecules or, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you can also consider 3D animation. But that's, you know, we're going towards the high end. Right, and so, of right. course, the price tag and complexity goes up. Right. But I would say a whiteboard animation is within reach to everyone. So I are, taught, are you going to I show taught, us an example? I can, absolutely. Just give me a second. Well, while you're doing that, I mean, one of the things that strikes me is I, I talk a lot about visual communication within the research process in, in my writing. And you know the difference between say having with the graphic uh, abstract, you have kind of the you've got the visual. Um, then with with the animation or the voiceover, now you have the audio and the visual and the text. So you've got you know kind of three three channels with the graphics. I guess you could say two because you could have written and visual. But then with this, you know, you would have you would be able to reach. I mean, thinking about the different learning styles that people have, you know, some people would prefer to listen, and some people would be prefer, you know, are more visually oriented. So you have a chance to reach, you know, wider range of of people. Absolutely, you made a really good point. Um, animation gives you the opportunity of showing some things, saying mm -hmm. some things, or some things you can both show mm -hmm. and say if they're really important. So uh, you can use both these channels uh, to get the message across. And so here, what I'm showing you right now is uh, on the left, what a, a whiteboard animation looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, it's literally, you know, a drawing that gets colored, a bit like a coloring book. Uh, and there can be a hand drawing it or, or not. And this used to be done um, by having you know taking real photos of you and your hand mm -hmm. drawing on a real piece of paper that was back in the days now it's all done in software so it's much faster and so you need to just either use preloaded graphics or bring your own graphics into the software and then the software will do the rest uh, and on the right instead you're looking at a 2d 
um, motion graphic animation. As you see, it, it doesn't have that, you know, a hand-drawn look. Uh, mm -hmm. These are um, flat vector graphics that can be animated in any way. So you can have a human character that is moving around, walking, talking, mm -hmm. raising an arm, you know. It gives you way more flexibility. Uh, researchers that um, benefit from showing some movement you know you know illustrating a certain process maybe this is a better option for them mm -hmm. um it, it depends if mm -hmm. if showing something moving makes sense for your specific research then this is probably a good option otherwise uh, the whiteboard animation i think it's just fine for for most researchers mm -hmm. also helps that is the most affordable kind so You've talked a little bit about, you know, with the with the poster and the response that that people got. But, you know, why should a researcher think about using um, these kinds of, of tools? And what would someone need to learn in order to get started? You know, whether they're uh, thinking about doing it themselves or or um, hiring someone. Yeah, so the, there's multiple reasons. Uh, so we we said the first reason that we. we Researchers should do this to stand out and not get mm -hmm. lost in this ocean of paper. Another reason, uh, which is broader, is that there's a lot of talking about open science, and that's right. great to remove the paywall so that mm -hmm. science can be free to read. Mm -hmm. However, there is another wall there that we haven't addressed yet, and that's the wall of jargon. Right. And so it can be just as uh, annoying to be a non-expert trying to understand what this research paper is about, but then you you, you smack uh, your face against this wall of jargon and have a terrible experience. And I realize there's lots of people, especially in the medical field, that lots of non-experts, for example, uh, patients or their relatives mm -hmm. and families that want to know what the latest research right. on a certain disease is. Right. So they really go and keep an eye on the latest uh, peer-reviewed research. Mm -hmm. As soon as it's published, they want to read about it. But then if they're not experts, they have this terrible experience. So this is another reason why visual communication, uh, especially if we gear it towards the general public, so we keep mm -hmm. the jargon out, can be really mm -hmm. useful. It's for to make science truly open. Right. So not only is free to read, but also free of jargon. Right. And, and well, that, in my opinion, is, is real open science. So one of the things that, that, that strikes me about that as well is it's not only, you know, reaching, say, from academia to practitioners or the general public, but also even within academia to people in other disciplines. And one of the things that strikes me when you're talking about conferences, well, right now, you, you know, increasingly conferences are online and whereas in the past because of the expense etc if i'm someone in the education field i'm going to go to the education conference if i'm in the business school i'm going to go to the business conference but now you know if it's something that appeals to me you know i can i can participate online and cross those disciplinary lines so i think it's you know more important than ever to present your research in a way that others could benefit from it because you know we need we need to draw from more than one discipline to solve the really you know big problems out there and if i can without being say an expert in your field be able to grasp you know that the kind of nut of that particular study then you know that that might be you know really valuable and and then maybe i'll you know it'll lead me to to want to look you know more deeply into it but um you know, I think there's a value, you know, just, you know, inherently in, in being able to communicate in a way that that someone without, you know, the kind of literature and theoretical background, et cetera, from your field would be able to grasp. 100%. Um, it's about making it accessible to people in other disciplines, but also other sectors. So maybe mm -hmm. you want to get your research notice, uh, not for by other academics, but by industry. Right. Um, maybe you need uh, investment from an industry partner. How mm -hmm. are, are they gonna find you? How are they gonna notice you if they cannot even understand what you're doing? Mm -hmm. So right. uh, there's another 
use case or perhaps uh, influencing policy. Maybe right. your research has some implication that should inform the next mm -hmm. uh, you know, developments of how we, we write our the next set of policies. Again, this is another mm -hmm. reason why we should make it understandable to the right. non-experts. Yeah. Then there is a, there's also evidence that uh, from peer-reviewed research that these tools, talking again, video and graphical abstracts are effective. They do their job. So mm -hmm. I've got some numbers uh, handy okay. that I'm going to mention. So for video abstracts, uh, there's a research paper from Zong from 2019 that found that uh, research papers with a video abstract end up having 120% more citations. <laughs> we know how important uh, they are. Significant. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, yes. pretty good. Um, then the, I found an internal study from Springer Nature, and they found that having a video abstract increased the number of reads of the paper mm -hmm. by 88% and the altmetric score by 106%. This is, was for video abstracts. For graphical abstract, there's a really neat paper that looked at Twitter in, in specific. Mm -hmm. And they found that if you share your new research paper on Twitter mm -hmm. with a graphical abstract mm -hmm. compared to without one, mm -hmm. so either you have just a string of text with a link or mm -hmm. you have a tweet with the graphical abstract like those I showed you mm -hmm. earlier, well, the number of retweets is eight times as high if you have mm -hmm. the visual component and the article reads are almost three times as high. So this is a study from I Ibrahim in 2017. Right. And, and, uh, and you figure, yeah, so, you know, at this point, again, you know, with the uh, COVID pandemic, which, you know, we hope will eventually go away, but in the meantime, you know, everything sure. has changed. And so we're increasingly need to think about, you know, the communication we're doing has an electronic component, either it's on social media, it's through an email list, a blog post, website. Um, so, and, and, those, and those mediums are more and more oriented towards visual communication. So as you say, you know, you're, you're either wading through you know, the, the piles and piles of, of uh, digital papers in a gigantic database to try to get someone's attention or, you know, you're trying to, you know, capture their attention online with, you know, all of the distractions that we have. And as we know, people have short attention spans. So if you catch their attention, then they've got the interest to go, you know, potentially and go read your work but in any case, they've learned something and probably will re remember your name. Certainly, and it, as you said, it's either you can just put it on online and hope people will find it <laughs> by a search, uh, or you can take things in your own hands uh, mm -hmm. and take a more active approach. And these tools uh, allow you exactly that. But I just, I wanted to just, uh, you know, uh, close by, you know, uh, asking you, you know, kind of, what, you know, someone views this and is thinking, oh yes, this is a great idea, I wanna do this. You know, what, what would be the place to start? What are some of the key steps someone would need to know if they're trying to think about how they could use uh, one or more of these forms of communication to either publicize uh, their, a, pa a particular paper or a book or, some other research deliverable? Sure. So you, you, the first thing to decide is whether you want to do it yourself or you want to outsource it. And so if you, I should say, ask yourself these two questions. Uh, do I have the time to do it mm -hmm. myself? Uh, because it will take a considerable amount of time, especially if you want to make a video abstract and you have no experience in video making, video editing and animation, it, be prepared mm -hmm. to spend a considerable amount of time. Like when I made my first ever um, video during my PhD, it took me two weekends and a few evenings. So if you're, you know, if you're a PhD student, it might, you mm -hmm. might be okay with dedicating mm -hmm. that time. Uh, but if you're a professor, I would say there's better ways you, for you to spend those time, those hours. 
Um, so if you're a student, it might make sense to learn the skills so then you have it for the rest of your career. Mm -hmm. But if you're you know, a mid-career researcher or beyond, it's way more efe efficient to outsource. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you need to ask yourself, do I need original artwork or not? Mm -hmm. um, man, a lot of research is about something very specific. Even if you pay for royalty-free graphics available on mm -hmm. online uh, repositories, you might not find what you need. Mm -hmm. And so then it makes more sense to hire somebody to do the mm -hmm. design custom mm -hmm. for, for your needs. And so if you want to do it yourself, um, we have lots of free resources. Um, uh, if you go on our website, so animeyour.science slash blog, uh, for example, we have a, a nice guide on graphical abstracts, which I would recommend Mm -hmm. everyone watching here let me quickly show you what that looks like yeah so if you find this blog on our site how to design an effective graphical abstract the ultimate guide this is a really high quality piece it's you know we're talking about over 2000 words it really goes in depth mm -hmm. uh, into you know considerations of graphical abstracts what they can look like and how to make it and so on and we also made, made it uh, fun to read uh, as much mm -hmm. as we could. Um, so it, it will be a fun read, I promise. And so that, that's a good place where to start if you want to do it yourself. Uh, honestly, we could not find similar online resources, so we, we had to create them ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, then if you decide instead to outsource, um, you, you, you want to use either an agency or a freelancer. Uh, the advantage of using an agency is that there's a lot less risk because an agency mm -hmm. has multiple animators or multiple designers. Mm -hmm. So if one person, for whatever reason, becomes unavailable, they can replace and make sure that the job gets done and right. gets done on time. When you deal with a freelancer, it's a bit hit and miss. Uh, you don't know if the person is reliable and it, something might come up and they might disappear and you're left there uh, in the middle of an unfinished mm -hmm. project. So I would say the agency is a safer approach. Um, also better if you're looking into making something at scale, not, not just one video, one graphic. If you're trying to make multiple ones at the mm -hmm. same time, that, that definitely choose an agency. Um, so when you go with an expert, uh, it's an easier process, of course, because they know what questions to ask. So for example, when you, uh, a client comes to us saying, okay, we want to make a video abstract about our research, we know exactly which questions to ask to then write that script. Mm -hmm. And the script really mm -hmm. is the most important thing. If the story is not good and simple mm -hmm. and easy to understand there's no amount of fancy animation that can save it, right, right. Uh, it, it it's really all it's really the most important thing is the foundation of the whole video right. um, so there's very important step and having that external perspective that an expert brings is mm -hmm. really useful to the researcher because you know the saying when uh, you cannot re read the label on the bottle when you're in the bottle <laughs> right which which means when you're in the, in the in the research it's really hard for you to say to somebody else what it right. looks like from the outside right, right. Uh, you know it's harder for you researcher to tell somebody new uh, to the topic what, what this really mm -hmm. is about right because you're you're so bogged down in the detail that that's what you see on a daily basis right that you, you, you kind of lose the, the broader perspective. Mm -hmm. And so using an expert uh, communicator, they will help you exactly doing that. They will be right. that external right. person, not familiar with the research, which is good. So that, because they're actually better positioned to tell others what the story really right. is. Right, right. What, uh, the, what's, what's significant about the story? Because sometimes we're so immersed in it and we might have a particular thought about what was valuable about that study and and kind of sell ourselves short because we're not communicating the whole story that Absolutely. someone else might pick up so yeah. well um thank you for uh sharing all of 
all of this information and giving us some examples. Um, we will include uh, links to the how-to guide that you mentioned. And if you're watching this video, please uh, log into uh, www.methodspace.com um, where you'll also find some additional posts um, and links. So thanks and uh, look forward to uh, featuring this work uh, and, and making it uh, available to our Method Space readers. Thank you so much, Janet. It was great to be here. And I, again, I invite everyone to use and abuse our free resources <laughs> because we, we put a lot of dedication right. and love into producing them. Right. Uh, and, and we know that they're being read by thousands every month. So don't miss out because it, we are really trying to educate researchers right. on visual communication uh, right. and we, we, we have a lot 